Our next speaker needs no introduction. He is, of course, Peter Molyneux. Right. Um, hello, everyone. I've got um, about 21 minutes to talk about my life's work and what I'm doing for the rest of my life. <laughs> Seems appropriate somehow, because I'm sure to overrun, as usual. Um, for, uh, firstly, I'd like to understand who all you are. So all those people who are in the computer games industry, whether you're indie or not, who are in some way involved in promoting or producing, stick, if you could stick your hands up uh, or develop or anything like that and could you stick your hands up if you want to be in the computer games industry now okay it's about 50 50 it seems like you two groups need to get together and sort each other out anyway today I'm going to be talking about um, this new um, startup I started back in March uh, called 22 cans talk a little bit about the motivation of that and a little bit about the first crazy thing that we're doing which is called curiosity experiment one um, first of all let's just cover who I am I've been in the industry since many of you in this room were sperms and um, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know I've, I've, I've done an awful lot of games I truly love what I do I love it as much today as I did that first day I sat behind a computer which was an acorn atom and wrote my first game which was a cross between a kung fu game and mastermind um, <laughs> uh, never came out but I truly love this industry. I think we are at the cutting edge of entertainment. I think the future belongs to us in, the, uh, in this room. This is who I am, you know, and my career, but it doesn't explain why I am, and I'm going to just to touch on that for a moment, because it's important that you understand this when I start talking about this experiment. I was working at Microsoft, um, I had a fantastic, amazing job. I was working at Lionhead. I had those 200 people at Lionhead. They're unbelievably talented people. We were making Fable. Uh, I loved the Fable franchise. Why on earth would I give all that up and go back to the to the turbulencies of indie development? Well, that all started with this video. Now, I'm going to be careful because I get all emotional. I get very emotional about this. I'm going to show you this video. Uh, here I was sitting at my desk at Microsoft and, you know, thinking, going through the trials and tribulations of, of, of you know, running a studio. And I was glancing through Vimeo and I saw this video. Oops. <laughs> right. As if it's very cheesy, but there is something in this video that really touched my heart. And here we go. Uh, play, play, play. I'll let it play all the way through. Curiosity. From the moment we open our eyes, it fuels our existence. It's the delight in discovery. The wonder of, well, wondering. Someone great once said, to learn is to live. Look up who will do you good. You see, it all starts with a question. It doesn't matter what you ask, just that you ask. Because the questions you'll find are more important than the answers. Curiosity gives birth to boldness and dares us to try. It's how we got to where we are today and how we'll get to wherever we'll be tomorrow. It's the spark behind the spark of every great idea. But no matter what we've done or what we've seen, we haven't done it all. And we certainly haven't seen it all. So keep listening for follow it. You won't be disappointed by where it takes you. Keep it running wild within you. Let it keep pushing you to discover your passions and make you crazy enough to chase them. We are all lifelong learners, 
from day one to 20,001. And that's why we keep exploring, wondering and discovering, yearning and learning, reaching with more than just our hands. I saw that video and I thought, what the hell am I doing with my life? How can I have lost that amazing feeling of invention, that incredible, scary, frightening, terrifying feeling when you have a blank piece of paper and you say, I'm going to create something new and something different. And that led me down a path to set up 22 cans. And uh, although it's insanely scary being an independent again, without the wonderful infrastructure of Microsoft, it is amazing, incredible experience to sit down every day and realize that you have that blank piece of paper. And what I've, I'm gonna go through is an approach to this company um, which hopefully might inspire some indies and uh, might inspire a lot of questions in the room for people to turn around and say, well, either that's crazy or that's a bad idea. But it is an approach which I think might be, um, it might be interesting to you. Um, so, <clears throat> it feels to me that every game I have made has led me to this point. And this point is one of the most exciting, well, it is the most exciting time in this industry. On the one hand, we've got these incredible experiences, these AAA core gamer experiences that sell anywhere between, you know, 20 million and, you know, 2 million. They are like incredible feature film quality experiences. Call of, you know, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Nintendo, those amazing experiences. On the other side, you have got some truly exciting, amazing, innovational little games which you have to hunt down on the App Store. You have to hunt around and find on websites on the PC. And you've got everything in between. And at this time, we need that huge spectrum of development that those polar opposites bring. Because the world has a problem. And the problem it's got, it's got too much technology and not enough products that use that technology. Now, we've, sport, uh, we've heard about cloud. There's adverts for cloud all over the place. You know, you, they're on billboards, on sides of buses. I still don't really get it myself. I don't really, it seems to me the only thing that cloud has done, this is a true story, I've got Apple TV at home and, um, uh, and of course I use an Apple, an iPhone and an iPad and you know, my iPhone has embarrassing photographs are, uh, on it and the Apple TV will choose, bizarrely, which photographs it's gonna show. <laughs> I had the local vicar round <laughs> And as I was talking to the vicar, up flashed one of those embarrassing photographs on my Apple TV in huge 50-inch splendor. <laughs> that seems to me what the cloud is all about. It's just, at best, it just does, does stuff that I don't really want it to do. On top of that, we've got this thing called multi-device. You know, gone are the days when we ask about platform, you don't ask about platform anymore. You don't develop for one platform, you develop for all platforms, for Android and iOS and PC and browser and consoles and Xbox Live Arcade. This huge array of different platforms. We can't expect consumers and gamers to, to not have our experience on one thing and have it on something else. We can't expect them to change from Nintendo to Apple to our consumers want it everywhere, and why not? But still, there isn't a really an applicant, there isn't really a game which really, truly shows that off delightfully. The audience which we've got is truly incredible now. You know, we used to be this select club. Just, so just three years ago, we were a club. A club of core gamers. 
a club which you only got into if you started gaming when you were like three. And it was totally inaccessible to the majority of the world. You know, it wouldn't you, you, you know, if you gave a controller out to, you know, your average human being, they'd look at it as if they'd been given some sort of weird pleasuring device. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, that, and it vibrated, of course. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you, now, suddenly, We've got, you know, this thing called social gaming. Bizarre name, by the way, because it's, I don't find that gaming at all in any way social, but other than these aggravating posts which appear from my would-be friends. We've got social gaming that, um, that have brought tens of millions. Tens of, I'll, I'll tell you one fascinating thing, one fascinating thing for everyone in this room. At this precise point in time, there must be a hundred million people on this planet playing a computer game. Just five years ago, that number was probably 10 million, at most. A hundred million people, just think of that. You could go home today and start working on a game which could touch a hundred million people's lives. How fucking cool is that, man? <laughs> and then, it, in addition to this whole new audience, we've got this thing called persistence. I love this word, persistence. I love the fact that just maybe someone is going to make a game out there that I could not play for 10 hours or 20 hours. I could play for a lifetime. Imagine me showing my grandchildren a game that I played when I was... 53, well, that's not too far away actually now, but you know, this idea that the things that we play can last forever, I love that idea. And then lastly, the what we're using to interact with these games is constantly changing. From touch to gesture control, from mad crazy things from Google, like Google Glass if you've seen it, um, to um, this, I, this new thing which people are talking about called haptic displays. That is all changing and up for grabs. So what an incredibly exciting time. If you mix that excitement with the video I saw about the curious thing, with the idea that why not go out and be a de an indie developer again, that's why I'm doing it. And uh, I've now taken up about 20 minutes just to put on a slide that was supposed to take five minutes. Anyway, let's just go through my plan. The plan is, the first thing is, being a designer, you know, it's a wonderful, incredible job, but it's, it, it doesn't mean anything unless you've got an incredible team. The ideas I have mean nothing without the team around me. So the first job of this new company is to bring together an amazing team of people. And it's not an, a team of people which is just people that I've worked with for you know, 10, 20 years, although there are people that are like that. I want to mix veterans with experts, with people who have never even been or thought of being in the computer games industry before. Pulling those, that team together and then saying to them, right, let's work on something that's never been seen before. That's the first and big step to take, to pull together a great team. The next is to develop an amazing, incredible, unique game. Now, <clears throat> that's not as hard as it sounds these days, because with all this technology out there, all you really have to do is think of a game that links all that together. But I love that 100 million number. I love it. I love that 100 million. And that, as a game designer, is what you want. That's your, you know, your fuel is when you think, can I make something for the world? Uh, I, you know, I love that idea. But there are problems with coming up with unique tech, uh, tech and unique game designs with a unique team. And those problems are, um, what I'm going to go through now and our solution to those problems. Because what we thought of doing is there's so much stuff to invent, we have to experiment a lot. And why not share those experiments to the with the world? So let's go through our first experiment. Um, 
And uh, the reason why we're doing these experiments is very simple. A lot of the tech that we all have to create, I'm not just talking about 22 cans or talking about the industry, really has never been invented before. How are you going to use the cloud? How are you going to appeal to a mass audience and appeal to, to core gamers? How are you going to create something which is, involves and brings together a community? These are all things that are really tough to get your teeth into without experimenting and involving the world in those experiments as you're developing the game is of crucial importance. Also, the other problem that these experiments that we're doing, which we're releasing, they do do is they pull this team together. Uh, if anyone's worked in recently in a new team, you'll know it takes a long time to get the culture and the fit of a team together. And if you're working on the most important thing of your entire life as in your first day, that can be somewhat prob uh, problematic. And lastly, there is a vast array of tools out there to use. And you know, trying to, to analyze which is the best tools as you're developing your game is problematic. So let's just talk about the first experiment that we're doing. And it's an experiment called Curiosity. And the idea is to, um, uh, to create something that is very intriguing for the world and to experiment with that, in both in terms of technology and psychology, to see how far we can push the most simplest idea. And the idea was um, I had after I watched a TED talk from J.J. Abrams. And he brought this box out on stage, and he sat it on stage, and he said, the reason I am a writer, essentially, I'll paraphrase, and the reason I'm a writer is because my grandfather gave me this box with a big question mark on it and said, uh, always wonder what's inside the box. And he spent the rest of his life imagining what was inside the box. Well, if that curiosity that J.J. Abrams had drove him to become one of the most successful screenwriters of all time, then there's something in that. So I had this simple idea, and the simple idea was this, was to have a cube which uh, people can tap on, and one person eventually, as they chip away at the edges of the cube, will get to the center, and something in the center of that cube will be revealed to that one person, and that would, would be something absolutely incredible and amazing. Um, so let's just go through, um, I'm trying to rush now because I know that I'm running a little low on time. Um, let's just go through some of the um, aspects of that. So initially, um, as you, this was the first inspiration shot I gave the team. This is back in March, the team consisted of these two guys um, here and a little design document and this was my art work. Uh, for the cube, and uh, so I, you know, I initially laid out this. This basically said, when you download the app onto any device, uh, you you activate the app. This white room appears in the corner of the room. Is this black cube? You touch the black cube and you float towards it. These words come up on screen: curiosity. What's inside the black cube? If you tap on the black cube. That it will s these little cracks will appear. You can keep on tapping. The cracks will get bigger and a little hole will appear. As you look at the cube, you can see other taps and cracks appearing. And that's when you realize that, that thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are all trying to chip away at this cube to find out what's inside. There's only one black cube. Seems simple enough, and me as a designer, you know, I'm sure it's going to take just a couple of weeks to do. But actually, when you think about it, it has a huge amount of technology. This cube experiment will support up to a million people simultaneously tapping on this one tube, cube and, and, and breaking little pieces away. Uh, this, uh, this experiment will have lots of gameplay motivations, very simple gameplay motivations in it, which we'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> 
So we started on that. Um, then, fortunately, um, we had an artist start, and he started with some concept shots. As you can see, you start getting a feeling of how big this cube is. It's truly vast. It's actually made up of around about 60 million cubelets, little tiny cubes, all of which can be tapped on individually. Um, uh, we realized that um, my initial com uh, idea was that people could tap and tunnel in to the cube and kind of sculpt the cube. This was technically incredibly difficult to do. And so we started to, to think of another way, which actually turned out to be an awful lot more interesting, and that was um, uh, um, rather than tap and tunnel, what you're doing is tapping and uh, clearing down one surface of the cube. And below, when that one surface is cleared, another surface is revealed. And on each surface, there can be surprises in there. So it's more like pass the parcel. We had uh, our st uh, um, architect start. He um, started to get very worried about security and hacking, which um, caused us to change the nature and the design of the cube again. Oh my god, oh, that's my time. That's my time. It's up. I'll just keep going a little bit longer. Uh, <laughs> Um, we had another artist start, and we started to think about the different views of the cube. When you're in close, what, what actually happens and when you touch a cube. We started to realize that some people will be very lazy when they tap. They'll do, they won't care about that tap. Other people will want to tap precisely. Um, we were th started talking about putting texture maps on the lower... Uh, the the deeper levels uh, uh, of the cube. We started to talk about this idea of people buying um, things to assist them in the cube, like uh, we have these things called chisels uh, that allow you to tap, and uh, rather than one cubelet going, a whole series of cubelet going, uh, uh, a whole series of cubelets being revealed. We um, were crazy enough to suggest that the diamond chisel uh, would be, I would go for $50,000. That's when someone told me that um, you couldn't have app purchases on iOS for $50,000. <laughs> Felt a bit stupid there, but uh, um, we started talking about leveling up. The idea that the more you tap, the more levels you go up. In other words, this incredibly simple design that was at the start, just like every game that I've ever been involved with, and any game per person here involved in games will know, designs are never fixed in stone. They always change, and if they change with something like this, just imagine what they change with, uh, larger, um, with larger games. Um, we got a little video here, just shows you the scale of the cube. Um, we need to start worrying about how the app spreads. As you can see, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty, that's pretty dark, but you can see it's a pretty big cube. We need to start worrying about how um, the app will spread, why people, the motivation for people to, to carry on tapping. So we, the cube is also a music visualizer. It will visualize music that's playing and as you're, uh, as you're tapping. Um, and the leveling up allows people to f get a, a sense of succession. And so for, we've got the final design now. And um, if anyone wants to come up later, I've got the final, well, not the final cube, but uh, a, a working cube on my phone. And you can see it working. Um, we have definitely decided that only one person in the world will reach the center. What is in the center of the cube is absolutely amazing. So amazing, I think it'll appear on news reports. Um, <laughs> and um, it's not a dead cat, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, and um, we, we, th we, think, we think that this very simple thing will actually really be really cool and exciting. Because as you chip into the cube, as the cube, just like pass the parcel, it's the psychology of pass the parcel. As a cube gets smaller, so people's excitement will get uh, larger and larger. You don't know what surface is going to be the final surface. 
you could be the one to finally open uh, this cube. We all have an, e an equal chance. Um, and we're, you know, we're incredibly proud of our, our uh, tech. Uh, it'll be coming out initially on iOS and Android, later on on PC browser, and we're considering some other uh, formats on the 22nd of August 2012, and it'll be free, except the apps. And we might, we might sell off surfaces, but we're thinking about that stuff. Um, there we are. We still need some uh, graphics programmers. Anyone's a graphic programmer in the room? Really desperately need those graphics programmers and artists. Please email me at 22cans.com. And anyone have any questions? Yes. yes, there's one in the back. I'm really in your Yes, I can't really hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go, Mike's going. Better be a good question, she's walking a long way. Hello. Hello, um, oh my God. I was interested in your, um, because I read you were gonna do profit share or making your developers shareholders of your yes. company because I have a developer too called Lady Shotgun Games and it's right. exactly what we do because yeah. I think that's, you know, getting away from the corporate shareholders yeah, is yeah. the way to. Yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, anybody who, uh, who's at 22 cans for longer than uh, about, I think it's three months, gets shares in the company. We, everybody at 22 cans are owners of the company. Obviously, I'm the biggest owner. Just put that out there now. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, but it is because I, and the reason I, and you know, maybe it doesn't make good business sense to do that, but maybe it does. But here's the thing I truly think. I am taking all the people that work at 22 Cans, I'm taking their life, man. I'm taking hours of their life, months of their life, and the least I can do is share the, this excitement and the success with them. I think it's incredibly important, you know. It, 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 the only thing that's going to make a great experience is the passion, the dedication of the people that work there. And sharing, us all sharing, and all feeling like shareholders, we try not. To, we try to make everyone feel like owners of the company, rather than being employees of the company. I think it's absolutely the thing to do, for sure. And well done for doing it yourself. Any other questions? One here. Firstly, I oh. repeat. Hello. Um, yeah, in a lot of your games, it's been sort of an over overarching god theme, straight off. Yes. We start from populous, going through to like black yes. and white <laughs> theme park. Um, yes. With the cube, was there any sort? Was there anything? to do with that sort of God aspect? Um, I don't know. I suppose I should say yes, really, for consistency purposes. <laughs> I, th I, I mean, um, the, 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 there is a, we a weird... If you were to, f to play around with it on, the, um, on my phone, there is this weird psychological thing happens when you start tapping on the cube because you get this sense of, of success, because we all love clear, cleaning up. This is one of the things about a God game, is that a lot of people, I've found, love cleaning stuff. I know that may seem strange if you're a, a developer, because if you look at my desk, it doesn't look like I like cleaning anything, but uh, we all like cleaning stuff. And you get this sense of satisfaction that you've cleared all these cubelets out, but then you pull back and you realize that this whole cube is being cleared. And in a way, it feels like a God game, where we're all gods. But maybe I'll just mend that up. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, there's one middle left and right. There's one, yeah. Uh, hi, since hi. this is more like a sociological um, experiment, yes. um, how long a run do you um, imagine this game will go on and are you prepared mm. for if it goes too fast to add additional layers in the background or something like that? Well, this is the big fear, isn't it? How, I mean, there's 60 million cubelets, okay. If um, everyone taps one cubelet a second, then well, someone will do the maths. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it would take one person 2,448 years or something ridiculous like that. But it's in, this is the problem. This whole experiment is a proof point of where we are in this industry. 
You don't know as a developer how successful your app's going to be. You have no idea. You know, this whole industry, the whole AAA industry, is built on the foundation stones of forecasts. Everything in this industry is driven off forecasts. Anyone that's worked on a AAA title will know forecasts drive your marketing budget, they drive the number, of, uh, the number of units that are going to be ordered, they drive your pre-order campaign, your TV advert campaign, the amount of development funding you have. In this world, in the indie world, where you're, you can release on any platform, you have no idea, no idea at all how well your, your go, uh, thing's going to do. Angry Birds, on Christmas Day, sold 6.8 million copies. That's insane! <laughs> insane! There's 6.8 million people twanging little things at piggy things at, at bricks. I mean, how could anyone have predicted that? You know, how could anyone predict that something like Draw Something, six weeks after it came out, the company was bought for 200 million by Zynga? That is insane. And um, <laughs> that's the whole point. The, the problem we've got with this experiment, for all I know, it could be just you lot that, that download the app and it's going to take you months to do. <laughs> or it could be, you know, it could be you know, millions of people, it might take them weeks to do. What I don't want to do is cheat. I don't want to start, the only thing I'm worried about is what's in the middle of the cube is so valuable, it's so life-changingly important that, <laughs> and you think I'm exaggerating, don't you? <laughs> you really do. But it is true, it's absolutely true, there are clues out there what is in the cube, by the way that um, I don't want to kind of waste the value of what's inside the cube. So in a way, my heart's torn. In one sense, I want you know, everyone to tap on it. In another sense, I want you know, it to last long enough so I can get lots of lovely data from it. Yeah, question <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, what you felt about the, uh, tw the Peter Molydew uh, Twitter account, and uh, mm. if you follow that closely. Yeah, I do, he's a smart guy. Um, <laughs> he is, I mean, I'll tell you one thing, he is far funnier, and far more daring, and far more engaging and entertaining than I will ever do, I'll, uh, than I will ever be, because he, uh, he just comes up with an endless supply of amazing, incredible ideas, and he's another reason why I left Microsoft, I have to tell you, he is, because he was out there, and I was watching his tweets and probably laughing for harder and longer than anyone else at them, and, and I realised that, hey, this guy, you know, he can do all this stuff, he he can be that free. He can explore these these ideas of throwing babies into pits and and you know oh, you couldn't do that with the corporate uh, the corporate PR machine at Microsoft. Good grief, no. And um, so so I one is I think he's fantastic. I think I'd love to see. Um, some of those ideas turned into games, and the Molly Jam thing that he organised was brilliant. I, I thought it was fun, absolutely brilliant. And uh, the other thing is, I think he, I hope he, you know, he, he carries on going for a long time. I don't think I deserve to be parodied by him, to be honest with you. I think he, you know, he, he's far more talented than I am at that sort of stuff, for sure. And he, uh, I don't know where, just where the other question. Okay, sir. Um, Hello. Um, mm -hmm. Regarding 22 cans and yeah. your experiments, I mean, yeah. I can see this is experiment number one. Yeah. Um, is that the sole purpose of 22 cans, is experimentation and seeing how people think and technology psychology integrate, mm. or is this driving to something bigger for 22 cans in the future? No, we are working on a game. We're working on a game. Absolutely, we're working on a game, and oh, some of, we know what the next experiment is. The next experiment, next big experiment. There are some, some experiments we're going to do within the cube, um, and a lot of the, one of the experiments, for example, is something called dynamic balancing. It's the ability to change any aspect of a game on the fly. We're not even having to wait. You know, I could go to a website and change the cube on my, my particular phone. And that's a piece of technology which me as designer never got into. But we are making that technology first, experimenting it with it in the wider world because we need it for this final game. And we're developing that final game at the moment. Um, you know, sometimes we are going to think, oh Christ, you know, how are we going to do this? 
And it was brilliant to have an audience of people that we can experiment on those ideas on. But every single experiment that we make is being done because we're testing technology or we're testing psychology or we're testing gameplay out so we can make a brilliant, incredible game finally. And our ambition is to do that um, within two years, about two years of today. That's, that's, that's our ambition. First, our first problem was to create a team. The second problem was think of the idea. Third problem, to realize what technologies we need which didn't exist. The fourth problem is how we can experiment with those technologies, and that's what these experiments are. It's also a way of kind of building a community because, you know, it's hard to build a community when you've got nothing to show. And, you know, at least these experiments are more outfacing. They also mean that an idiot like me, when I, you know, sit in front of the press, I tend to get so excited and those ex excitement is read as promises a lot of the time. It's a way that those promises can be proved. <laughs> Any other questions? Just as loads, yeah. She's jogging. Hi. Um, so. Will the results ever be, be made public? Or are they something just for your internal? Uh... Yes, we're making it public. We, we're working with Edge, um, uh, uh, and we're going to be publishing the results. Um, as soon as the um, Curiosity experiment comes out, we're going to be publishing and sharing those uh, results with Edge, and Edge are going to help, help us analyze them. We've got, you know, I'd love, for example, to do an online um, app where people could look at aspects of the cube, but we just simply haven't got the resources to work on that. But we are going to publish all our collected data. We're also going to be publishing the um, transition of the cube from its start to um, to its release and how the cube is actually the the cube and the curiosity experiment how that's changed just because it's an interesting experience because it's so pure you see there's nothing it's such a pure simple thing uh, idea you know cube that you've got to tap like pass the parcel but even that idea has changed so we're thinking we're going to publish that we haven't spoke to any journalists about that yet but um, yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, I understand the experiment, but um, it gets a bit sinister when you've got the pickaxes that you pay for. Because mm. isn't that turning it into an experiment? How much are people willing to pay with the promise of something in the future? Yes. But that's not very nice. <laughs> why? Why? Hang on, why? Why? Why is that not nice? Because well, so it's already been thing. done in every game. No, but we here's the thing: is that we to... can't be ashamed of asking people to spend money. Profit. We can't be ashamed of that because, for me, as a designer, that is proof that I have done something meaningful. And I am not saying I'm not I'm not saying that you have to buy these chisels. I, I, I don't expect the diamond chisel ever to be purchased. <laughs> um, if it is, I want to meet the person who buys it because. <laughs> You know, there may be an investor or something. <laughs> um, but I, and I'm not doing this to purely monetize, but I don't mind monetization. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of. Because if, you, if I, you turn around to someone and say, you know, would you pay for this? They're only going to pay for something if they really feel involved in that something. And that's the whole point. It's all part of motivation is that if we, especially in this world of free to play at the moment, so many mistakes. Me as a consumer sees this time and time again. I don't know if anyone agrees with me. So many mistakes is made in free to play. I hate where, when free to play is all about um, being greedy, overly greedy, where a lot of products are like that. I think some free to play is just slapped in on the side. I'd love, free, I'd love free to play to feel like an investment for someone. And if someone is enjoying tapping so much, then they should be able to upgrade their uh, upgrade their chisels. I don't I don't mind that. We, you know I don't expect for a second the cube to make us any money. You know it's actually costing quite a lot to develop it because it's not just a as you saw from the visuals it's not just a you know a cube. It's a, you know it's a real technology. But but the reason I'm charging for the chisels is as a proof point on that motivation is the simplest form of motivation, the very simplest form of motivation in the world. 
You cannot get simpler than saying, what's in the box? Is that and sufficient to ask people to invest money in? And that's going to be a fascinating experiment. We may never sell a single chisel. But I think that we have to experiment with free to play. How are we going to monetize the thing that we're, we're doing? You know, we're not just doing it for free. That's my opinion. You know, yeah. Popular or not. Next question. Maybe do two more, Peter. Yeah, two more questions. Hi. Uh, you yeah. were talking about persistence. Um, yeah. But what happens when you open the cube? Uh, it, will there be another cube after that? Or so when you are, when the, when the, this is going it's a bit weird there's another th another strange theory of mine when you the the final cube has been revealed it will only be shown to one person in the entire world and we're leaving it down to that my big fear by, by the way that this one person is like my son or something wouldn't that be terrible because <laughs> you all think that, but that one person is up to them to use social media to spread what has been in the cube and then that is it your your cube on your your cube 22 uh, cans experiment on your phone if you launch it again, the cube will be done. Now, I don't know. I actually don't know what will happen. We might have another cube. It, I just couldn't. I couldn't possibly put another surprise that's so significant in another cube. By the way, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I may do that. Our plan, though, is is that before the cube is finished, and this is scary as well, we will have the next experiment. Uh, launched, uh, ready, um, so that your app, your 22 Experiments app on your device will be able to do the cube and the cooperation experiment. Did I, was that clear or just very confusing? I'll take silence as clear. <laughs> Last question. Um, the, you were stating that as a small company, you don't have the resources to, say, visualise the data that you're gathering from the project. Well, Why not allow your fans to do that? Well, it's an interesting thing, a very interesting idea, and I think that's one of the experiments is that if I just gave the raw data out to the world, maybe, maybe someone would do that, and we might, well th we might well think about that. It's just that I'm no, I don't want to promise that we'll have some amazing thing like www.appdata.com with graphs and charts and stuff like that. I'm, all I'm saying is that we're, a lot of the, resu the results we'll share will be through um, the edge, um, the edge articles, and um, through the you know this diary feature, which we haven't kind of signed up at the moment. But I might consider releasing not only all the data, but all the design docs um, of of uh, and you know everything to to the world. I'm totally happy to do that. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, everybody.